The Battle of Britain was Hitler's attempt to try and grind down the RAF through a war of attrition, get the numbers down, succeed by having more aircraft than the opposition, the RAF. And that ran from July until October 1940. But the real reason we're here today is that on the 7th of September 1940, something else began. Hitler's strategists said that they wanted to try and grind down England, and in particular, the people who lived in the capital. And they did two things. They switched to bombing the RAF's infrastructure, their airfields. But more importantly, they began to unleash a terror war on London. They called it the Blitz. And if you look at uh, American newsreels of the time, what we always see is a description of plucky Londoners making light of the Blitz. Now, this really didn't work, and it's quite extraordinary because London was bombed systematically for the next 57 days and nights. And most notable was a very large attack on London with hundreds and hundreds of German bombers on the 15th of September. And what is very strange is, despite the weight of the attack, in a way, that is the blitzkrieg, the lightning attack, it really had very little impact. And when we look back at uh, historians' accounts of the time, what we find is that we didn't have the equivalent of PTSD. They weren't Londoners, as you three know, suffering from what we would call shell shock or aftershock. They just got in with normal life. Progressively, the bombing moved away from London, although it did continue throughout the war, and it moved towards the industrial heartlands, places like Birmingham, where the majority of our aircraft were being produced. But again, it didn't have the desired effect with most factories up and running again within less than three to seven days. Now, that isn't to deny the impact of the Blitz. About 40,000 civilians were killed by the Luftwaffe, more than half of them in London. And I think one of the most telling statistics, as I'm sure you're going to tell us, gentlemen, is that over a million houses were either destroyed completely or were damaged. And so that big push, the Blitz, we got through it. And we got through it with the plucky determination, the dogged spirit of men like these. I'm going to introduce you to James Little, to Eddie Reed, sorry, to Harry Puttick, and to Eddie Reed. Forgive me, gentlemen, I'm hopeless on names. And I think we'd all be fascinated to know, perhaps you could kick us off, James, with where you were and how old you were when the Blitz began. Yeah, I was nine. Um, at the, at the outbreak of war, and of course the Blitz followed <coughs> fairly closely after that, you know, six months or so. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I lived in, uh, or with my parents, obviously, uh, on the, uh, not far from Harrow, between Harrow and uh, Stanmore. And of course Stanmore was where Bentley Priory was, and Bentley Priory was the headquarters of Fighter Command, which became a target for the German bombers, because that's where... Air Marshal Dowding was controlling the Battle of Britain, literally. Uh, so <clears throat> once it started, um, most nights, I mean, before it started, we were told there was going to be a bombing attack. And uh, like the rest of my friends here, right, we all helped our fathers dig holes in the garden and put Anderson shelters in and so on and so forth. And then when it started in, in earnest, Right, that's where we spent most of our nights, either that or in the cupboard under the stairs, depending on, you know, uh, what the circumstances were. Uh, and you could tell the, uh, uh, the German aircraft by the distinctive drone of their engines. Uh, and you could, if you were outside, which you didn't want to be, um, searchlights were going and all that ack ack was going on. And in the morning, uh, the pavements and the uh, streets would be littered with large lumps of metal that were the fragments of the uh, anti-aircraft fire that had come whistling down. So there were two hazards, really. There were the bombs the Germans were going to drop, and there's large lumps of jagged metal that was coming down from the shells that the anti-aircraft people fired at them. Um, uh, and that was, uh, <coughs> to us, uh, me at nine years old, I mean, this was a case of finding the biggest lump and swapping it when you went to school. <laughs> So on and so forth. So I've done it you off. Yeah. Harry, do you, do you remember building a, an Anderson shelter? Yes, I do. We dug the hole and we got it all fitted out. Luckily, our garden was dry, 
so it wasn't as if it was going to flood. And uh, making it up, putting in the bunks and doing it and trying to make it comfortable, if you could say that. But yes, I remember that very well. Very interesting time too. And uh, everybody was sort of digging their gardens up. And I also remember watching it. I, I went to the cinema and of course all the people out, outside London were coming in and they were digging trenches in Hyde Park and everything as anti-aircraft shelters. But uh, I don't know whether they were really effective in the, in the overall thing, but the Anderson shelters certainly were. And there was a modicum of comfort as well. How long did it take to go up? To, to build it? I didn't do it all my own. <laughs> my dad built it. I was just handing bits of stuff. Uh, I think it took us best part of an afternoon. Really? Uh, or, you know, when I say afternoon, up to about 10 o'clock at night, because that, that was it. If we didn't get uh, too many air raid sirens going off, and we couldn't really dive into the shelter because we still had bits to tighten up, you know. But uh, no, I remember that very well. Did Quite you have one, Eddie? An Anderson shelter, definitely. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, but Daddy didn't have to dig it himself. <laughs> Our council had men, had uh, gangs of men going around the um, the town where we lived, and um, they dug the hole, fitted the sh fitted the corrugated iron uh, Anderson shelter. Uh, I always remember it depended on the number of persons in the household, how many, uh, how big the um, Anderson shelter would be. Uh, we had one of the largest because uh, I had three siblings and my f mother and father, so um, um, we had one of the larger ones. Uh, but Harry is right, actually. M most of the time, we were trying to make the shelter habitable with little bits and pieces which we could. Um, and initially, there were no bunks available. It was only when the blitz really started that the local council decided to put bunks in. And we had bunks to enable us to sleep in there all night, if it was necessary. And were they comfortable? Uh, I don't remember being uncomfortable. <laughs> Seriously, I, I don't remember, but I, I was young. I was 11 when the war started. and. Um, Maybe it's a, a um, part of part of youth. Nothing will happen to me, you know. And um, uh, looking back on it, it must have been frightening. But I, I can't really recall ever being frightened. It, um, how, how did your mother? Um, <coughs> how did your mother treat having to go into? the Anderson shelter every night. Was it a chore for her, do you think? Yeah, I think for an adult it probably was because, as, you know, the bunks, were they were a pretty primitive thing. Uh, for us, being smaller, right, you know, you could fit in almost anywhere, but for an adult it was pretty... Yeah. I mean, they weren't all that long, these Anderson shelters, you know, seven foot, something like that, you know, so yeah. you've got a six-foot father, you know, his head's banging at one end, his feet are banging the other. And, of course, one above the other... Right, and of course, it's <coughs> if the person in the top bunk was rather heavy, the person in the, the underneath bunk, right, <laughs> didn't have much headroom. <laughs> but uh, the, I think the thing I don't know about the others, but my father always kept a little box in which he had his emergency supplies. Right, you know, mm -hmm. uh, key amongst them, of course, was a bottle of brandy. You know, just if, if things got a bit too hot, you know, uh, we'll have a little calming down sup. You know, not me, but mum and dad did. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, uh, <coughs> but they were very, they were very effective in their way because they were covered with a, I mean, partially buried in the ground and then covered with the soil that you dug out the hole. So we were short of a direct hit, you were pretty safe from any fragments that were flying around and there were a lot of flag fragments flying around. Does anyone remember um, a neighbour's house being taken a, a direct hit? Uh, Not a neighbour. In our road, uh, we had one high explosive bomb which dropped on the road and destroyed three houses. Wow. Um, but that was the only high explosive um, bomb or event that we, we, which we had. We had incendiaries uh, subsequently, but um, 
that was when three houses were um, destroyed. Everybody else had their windows blown in for the blast. Mm. Um, but as I say, the, the, you went to school in the next morning without any problem. And did you, did you have special lessons at school for how to react if there was a bombing raid during the day? I can't, re I can't remember that. I can't remember having any special... Um, mm. The only special lesson was, you know, when the siren went, get in the <laughs> shelter. In the shelter, that was it, yeah. Uh, and presumably you all carried uh, a, a little box with your gas mask. <laughs> right? yeah. 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 Yes, yeah. yes, that little square box. A bit of string um, and a cardboard box. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always amazed that those things lasted for so long. Well, was, well they didn't, but that, that you could buy little boxes. All industry, put it in, all it? industry oh. grew up yeah. uh, patterned covers for the, so that the ladies wouldn't look out of, with, a, with a, just a cardboard box around their shoulders. They had patterned <laughs> oh, right. covers for them, you know? Oh, yeah. Do you know, I, I remember as a child playing with one of those gas masks. Yeah. And realising that very quickly, they're quite claustrophobic. Oh, yeah. And they're also, they, they, they make you sweat. Yeah. And uh, the exactly. rubber smelt a bit. Yeah. It wasn't a very pleasant experience. No. Uh, no. I think the important thing to get a, a, a perspective on is that the flight path of the German aircraft. I mean, to start off with, they attacked the docks, the London docks. So it was Wapping and the East End and the London docks. And then eventually, of course, they decided on that the, the broader population was just as good a target as well. So, but they used to fly up Thames, which is that, that's just flying up the Thames at leading to London. And then once, if you think of the geography of it, once they dropped their bombs or whatever on London, then they'd all turn to go home. And invariably, they turned round over where we were living, over Harrow, Wheels, that part of it, they, you know, northwest London. And anything was left over, they dropped. So it's, uh, you know, they'd have two bites of the cherry, for, for want of a better term. You know, one, one they'd, they'd bomb London, and it, if it was got a bit crowded over the skies and some of them had something left, they'd drop it on us on the at the same time, especially if, it, if they were having a go at Bentley Pryor, as they say. I remember reading that um, probably the biggest landmark in London at the time was Battersea Power Station. And you really couldn't miss it in daylight, you know, with the, the, the big stacks. Mm, yeah, a very large building, and very important to the economy, the infrastructure of London. And yet it was never hit. Yeah, I, I'm just going to say, I, I could never, was never sure whether that actually suffered any damage. And I, I, I don't think it did. I don't think it did. I'm, I'm not going to say that the bombing was indiscriminate, um, but where I lived, we had a Royal Small Arms Factory, um, but it was several miles from where we lived, but that was where the Bren gun was made, and uh, that's where the EN comes in, being made in the Royal Small Arms Factory in Enfield. But I, I cannot recall, that would have been a, a target for the German, I cannot recall ever hearing that the small arms factory had been attacked any night during the Blitz. But and yet, strangely, uh, in, in bright light, they could have followed the River Lee. Well, oh, yes, yeah. London. Yeah. exactly. They yeah. could have also gone to Hatfield and bombed. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The but factory, air factories there. Oh. Yeah. But then they didn't really need the river to find their way into London because of Croydon Airport. They were yeah. in and out of Croydon Airport right the way through the 30s, weren't they? So uh, at the same time, I, I do honestly believe their policy was to scare the population oh, yeah. into submission right, yeah. or, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you know, what I, what I would find hardest as uh, someone from a, a slightly younger generation is not having the choice of food. And during the Blitz, you must have had some terribly narrow choices of food. What, do you remember what you were eating on a daily basis? Well, the rationing, oh, rationing. Or, the rationing with it, with, but cauliflower cheese. Yeah, but there again, you see, we've been told afterwards we were never healthier. That's right. Having healthier eating habits than we had we, we, since since the war, we've we, we've um, they've disappeared. You know, I, I forget what how many ounces of butter a, a week or um, no fruit. No, no, it was not a banana, not a banana. Not a banana. It was only apples. Apples in, apples in season, but yeah. oranges, bananas, no, anything yeah. like that. No. Do you know, I remember a story of someone who cried 
Yeah. When they had their first orange. Yeah. The war was over. Oh, and yes. the supplies yeah. were coming back. Well, seriously, when the, when the Americans came over into the war in 1942, this was the headlines in the papers where they were holding up bananas, <laughs> bananas in, spam. in the air. You know, this is spam, tins of spam. 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 Yeah. spam. spam. Oh, I still miss it. I still miss it. Now, could you, could you get round Russian books? Was there a way of getting supplies to well, the Blitz? Not really. They asked me. I was too young. I didn't deal with it. I'm sure my mother had a few there wrinkles up her sleeve. You know, every mother, every housewife always flung her charms at the grocer, the butcher, for a little <laughs> bit extra. Uh, there's your coupons, you know, but can we have another... It happened all the time, of course. You know, but, uh, I think the interesting thing to remember is that throughout all of this, the infrastructure of London suffered but didn't fail. Yes. Tubes right. ran, the railways ran, yep. the electrics... I agree. You know, the gas yeah. supply stayed I on. I agree. So all the, all the utilities, right, and the people that ran the utilities, right, did a fantastic job to keep everything up and running. So who was clearing up the mess the next morning? Everybody. Everybody. Oh, yeah. Um, Just a community effort. Yeah. Well, I used to go well, around with a couple of workmen, right? They're like right, a right. young lad. They had their bag of tools, and, you know, put it, banging frame, wooden frames over windows and stretching it off. You know, yeah. polythene, not polythene, because it didn't basically didn't didn't exist. Celluloid sheets or, yeah. or sheets of plywood where the windows had been blown out. James has a theory. Fun. Tell me your theory about national car parks. Oh, yeah. I mean, the big, the big, fantastic business success story, of course, is National Car Park. Because after the war, or during the war even, National Car Parks cleared the bomb sites right. and started using them as car parks. Car park. So every, if you think about it now, the Blitz, the, the sites of the Blitz still exist in London. You go to a National Car Park and that was a, it used to be a block of flats or houses or a warehouse that was bomb flat. And presumably very cheap to buy. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you know the the? I mean the the the, the Blitz straddled a Christmas, nineteen forty mm. to nineteen forty one. Mm. Does anyone remember anything about their Christmas during the Blitz? Other than the fact it was pretty austere. It was austere. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, Christmas was still celebrated. Yes. But, uh, it was always looked forward to. Yeah. Mm. How do I mean? How did it, if there wasn't enough food at the time? How did you make it feel Christmassy? There wasn't enough food, Neil, but the point was that uh, it was not Christmas food. You didn't have... I think my mother made a Christmas pudding. Yeah. And uh, didn't make a Christmas cake because of, obviously, the decoration. But uh, they made do and mend, and we, we all got used to that. I think that's where it came from, wasn't it? Baked do and mend. Yeah. Food, food, Harry. But uh, I cannot recall a Christmas during the war when we didn't have a turkey or a That's goose right. or something like that. Um, a, lot of, a lot of it came over from Ireland, mm. oddly enough. Um, they used to have special planes bringing the stuff over on, on the boats. Um, but there was always turkey. A lot of it was from Ireland coming over, you know. So did, did the government make a, a special effort to keep... Spirits up. They did. Oh yeah, they're bringing did. the stuff into. Oh the yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. There was there was um, there was a lot of morale building stuff indeed, going on with indeed. posters and everything else. Indeed, uh, indeed, Jason. And I think this is the key thing about the infrastructure. The railway still worked. <coughs> Excuse me. The railway still worked. The buses worked. The trams worked. You know, the tube worked throughout the whole of it. They had problems. They got bombed. They got damaged. And they got repaired, and they went back. And I think this is probably. Uh, uh, something that the, the, the Mr. Adolf on the other side didn't actually bargain for. He thought that once he bombed it, he'd destroy the morale, but he did not affect the morale one way. In fact, if anything, he strengthened it. And of course, we had those amazing bomb shelters, the underground stations. Yes. Yeah. I, I, when I when I look at uh, you know, pictures from that period, there were two that strike yeah. home for me. The first is St. Paul's Cathedral. Mm. standing yeah. proudly with yeah. damage all around it yeah. and the smoke, but yeah. untouched. Yeah. And you might think perhaps you know, God's looking after his cathedral, but the, you know, the other thing is people sleeping in their hundreds mm. in underground stations. That's correct. Yeah. And it's very hard to imagine it, people just settling into that as the norm. It was, part, it was part of life 
and they adapted to it. And in fact, there was some sense of enjoyment uh, going down to the, the tube shelters at night and uh, picking your spot where you were going to lie. <laughs> oh, really? But it, James, uh, led, during the war, when the, and the, the uh, keeping the morale up, there, I, I still remember the half a dozen slogans that existed during the war. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, don't forget there's a war on. Um, don't talk. Keep, keep on. Talk. That's right, yeah. Um, lives. Loose lips cost lives, yeah, and all right, that sort of thing. All, all these uh, slogans were... Keep calm uh, and carry on. <laughs> yeah, keep Dig for victory. Uh, Dig for victory. Yeah, and big. We're doing that now, aren't we? We're doing this. <laughs> we cigar stuff, didn't it? I see you mentioned dig for victory. Yes. It was this enormous push to dig up uh, football every, pictures. Oh yeah. Public parks. That's right. There every plot, gardens. every yeah. plot of land, spare land, was used to produce vegetables and right. um, everything like that. I know. mean, the biggest park in London, Hyde Park. Yep. Yes. It had bomb shelters and it also yeah, had yeah. a big allotment, yeah. big gardens, yeah. turned over to vegetables. Yeah, products. absolutely. Yeah. Interesting you mentioned the bomb shelters because the less luxurious shelters were the brick ones that were built in all the streets. Yeah. yeah. And they built a lot of them. And there was like brick block, ob oblong brick block houses. Uh, not very pleasant places to spend any time in, I must confess. No. And did they work, by the way? Were they effective? Uh, I, I, I think if, if, if a bomb landed anywhere yeah. within 50 yards, it, it didn't work wouldn't very survived, well at all. It wouldn't have survived yeah. a direct hit or um, yeah. a, near, uh, a near, near miss. So I mean, we'd have had to go, because I came from Croydon, so they would no undergrounds, no nothing there, yeah. really. Yeah. So uh, it would be just be a case that if, if you didn't have an Anderson shelter, God knows where you went. You knew where these things were, these brick-built shelters, but you doubted them, really, you know, I think, don't really fancy that. But people I mean, got I was, a bit blasé, really. I was ten years old. I mean, um, what would I know about it? But I just looked at you know, it all. You always felt safe in an Anderson shelter because you were half underground. That's and, right. Oh. But you know, for people who, who don't know what an Anderson shelter is, and when I grew up, they were everywhere. Yeah. Uh, in a lot of cases, the earth had gone. But it's just a very flimsy piece of... It's corrugated, corrugated, iron. corrugated, corrugated iron. Yes. Yeah. Nissen, the Nissen. Earth. It worked. Nissen. Oh, absolutely. Oh, it worked. It was, it was, it was there to support the earth. You dug out the hole. And also, rather like an egg. Yeah. Ground shape is very strong. Yeah. Absolutely. And generated a lot of condensation. Exactly. Later on during the war, they introduced Morrison shelters, yeah. which were for inside the house. Yeah. Uh, it doubled up as a table, perhaps, during the day. But at night, if there was a, a raid on, or the family was underneath, it, underneath the um, these, these were steel, really good quality steel. Um, heavy. It was, but, uh, yeah. There is a funny side to things, though. My mother and father were very keen solo whist players, and their Saturday night was two of their friends had come and they, they set up their solo school. And they'd sit round the, the table in the front room, you know, where only used for visitors and Christmas. And, uh, and, uh, if the sirens went, right, then that was the signal to do something. I got oiked out in bed downstairs, and because it was it was Saturday night in the car school, I was in the cupboard under the stairs because that that was recommended as being the strongest part of the house. He was and I can remember peeping out through the door and seeing four backsides sticking out from under this table where they they got their heads under, but the rest of them couldn't get in there. Oh, good. <laughs> Stuck in my memory all my life. Fantastic. Yeah. Was anyone, was any one of you evacuated? Yes, no, I, I wasn't. wasn't. I wasn't. You weren't? Because I you were too far away. From the, from well, the no. Mom, we had the opportunity of being evacuated, but mother and father said, no, we remain as a family. If we go, we'll go as one unit. You know, that was their, um, their thinking. You know. Well, I was evacuated, and I went on the 4th of September, which was the day after war was uh, declared. And uh, I stayed, got on the train with all the others, you know, a little gas mask in my hand and a bag of whatever they had in and the a, other. And a label. Yeah, and a label, yes, yeah. Yes, exactly, the label. And they oh. all had those. Yeah. But anyway, my destination, I found out, was Brighton. They were sending me to be closer to the Germans than my family were, you know. And uh, anyway, we, we had that. And... Uh, after being in Brighton for about four months, getting through that bad winter, 
of uh, 40. 40. Uh, we, we went from there to uh, another really safe place, Camberley, near the Staff College. <laughs> and uh, I thought, this is no game, this. But uh, I stayed there for another three months, I think, and I, I said to my mum, come on, I want to come home, please. James, did you, were you yeah, I went to East Grinstead, but I didn't last as long as Harry. I, I, after a fortnight, I'd had enough. I was back home. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, being evacuated was not the most pleasant of experiences because no, there no. you were with a whole load of strangers yeah. who weren't really interested in you particularly. Other snotty nosed kids. Yeah. Were they, were they paid to look after you? Sorry. Were they paid to look after you? Oh yeah. No, yeah I don't really were. know. Oh, yeah, they were. I, they were. I think they had to pay them. Yeah. 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 But the, the life in the country was totally different to the life in London. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we were, we were generally regarded as oh, you know, London uh, snotty nose There really, back. really some great cartoons in the newspapers yeah. about evacuees from London being that's in right. the country and yeah. uh, looking, looking at a clutch of eggs and saying, that's a hen's nest or, um, you know, ah, yeah. Now, I, I mentioned before that uh, because of the Battle of Britain, we had uh, those two Spitfires and two Hurricanes over. A wonderful sound, as we all know. And somebody mentioned that when you heard the sound of a Spitfire, yeah. you knew you were safe. Yes. If you ha heard the sound of a, of a German player yeah. Yeah. and you knew a Heinkel or whatever, well, you'd have to run like hell. Yeah. Right. But, there was but you've been up in a Spitfire. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about that. And it's, I can assure you, it's built for 18-year-old fighter pilots. It's not built for, you know, fat old people like me. It wasn't that long ago, was it? No, it was uh, 18 months, thereabout. Fantastic airplane. But you've got to remember, right, the bombing raids were mainly at night. Very few daylight raids. The daylight raids didn't come until the doodlebugs later on and the V2s and mm -hmm. that sort of thing, which, if anything... Uh, uh, were probably a bit more terrifying than the blips itself because you never had damn V2s coming. But um, <coughs> uh, the uh, tell us about what it's like when you're in the the rear seat of a Spitfire. Are you thrown around? No, it's not enough room to be thrown around. It's a very tight fit. I mean, these guys that say it's uh, these guys that say it fits you like an overcoat or a suit are absolutely right. I mean, it's almost as though the aircraft is built around you. There's, there's not a lot. I mean, you can move your feet. Right? You can do the control stick, and you've just got this dashboard with all these in instruments in front of you, and that's it. And you could see the, the speed you were going at, couldn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You can see how fast you were How fast did you go? Yeah. Oh, you got about 250 odd miles an hour, I suppose, something like that. You know, I mean, this was a, this was a, this was a pleasure flight. It, it wasn't nothing in earnest about it. You know, we weren't going to shoot at anybody. But a fabulous experience. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it's an icon, iconic aircraft. Somebody said to me that the strange thing about flying a Spitfire is that you can't hear the sigh of the Merlin because the, the air just rushes past you. Yeah. So you can hear the air, yeah. but you can't you hear, hear the engine so loud. You can hear it when it starts up and takes off. Yeah. Um, and when you come back, you can hear it. But, uh, I mean, the interesting thing is the... The takeoff and landing. I mean, maybe it's 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 not it's not a three-wheeled aircraft. Oh, it's two. So the pilot's looking out looking out the front of the cockpit like this, taking off and landing. You know, it's uh, it's uh, I mean, when you think that these guys, right? They were what, 18, 19 years old. They come out of school or college or wherever it was they were. They they were in a Spitfire in combat after five hours training on a on a on a Harvard or something like that. The, the attrition rate of the pilots in the Battle of Britain was very, very high indeed. And we know those youngsters, the really young ones going up for the first couple of times, yeah. they exhausted their ammunition straight away. That's it meant that when they were challenged, yeah. they literally couldn't fight back. There was, I think, uh, I think the, the thing was that they were two second bursts and they'd get off something like a hundred rounds in two seconds. You know, it's... Uh, it's uh, You've got to take your hat off to the young men of those days, you know. And sometimes I walk down the King's Road and look at the young men of these days and do a little bit of a comparison. <laughs> I, think, I think it's the hardest thing for all of us, looking back, who didn't experience what you did, how it could all become a normality. 
that every night you would know that you'd go to bed. Oh, yeah. Whether in your house or in the Anderson yeah, shop. Very true. And you were going to be woken up. Yeah, very yeah. true. But the other thing, the other point's worth making is the Spitfires didn't fly at night. Right? The night fighters, right, which are probably twin engine aircraft, like bow fighters or something, Hampton, yeah. right, were, were down on the coast trying to stop them getting to London. The people over London, it was mainly anti aircraft fire, searchlights and anti aircraft guns. And. Uh, and yeah, cat's, uh, cat's eyes cunning them as well, didn't we? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was there. Yeah. It was an ace who took down quite a lot of planes. He was a night, a night, fighter. night fighter pilot. Yeah. He was a night fighter, which. But when James said about the, the planes coming at night, I remember seeing them at the daytime in the early days, <coughs> and there were stacks of them coming oh, yeah. up. Mm. And, you know, the bombers were there and the fighters coming in and out. And then you saw about three of our blokes diving That's in amongst correct. them. That is correct. It, it was really yeah. fantastic. That was the fantastic part of the Blitz, is that... How the fighter pilots so were Summer controlled. of 1940. It was a concerted yeah. effort by the Luftwaffe. Yeah. Uh, they put up as many planes as they could in order to um, subdue, uh, particularly London, the population of London. Yeah. Well, I mean, the statistics prove it. Yeah. Yeah. James the, Ger the Germans crossed the Atlantic from the Par de Calais to Dover in eight minutes. From takeoff to get into fighting altitude, 20 odd thousand feet for a Spitfire, was 15. So these guys had to get the height. The, I mean, the rules of World War I air combat still applied. Height and out of the sun. And of course, in the days of the big wing, Varda's big wing, yeah. it was even more chaos. That's right. Trying to assemble all those squadrons up at various layers That's right. before moving over. Yeah. So you probably needed an hour warning. Yeah. Which they normally didn't have. Yeah. Now, you mentioned before V1s and V2s. Mm -hmm. And they made a huge difference because it wasn't the noise, was it? No. You worried about when there was no noise. Well, there was with a V. There was with a V1, the doodlebug. Yeah. It's when the noise stopped oh, you yes. had to worry. They would just drop. <laughs> That's right. But the rockets, the V2s, you just they nothing. were they weren't all true. of a sudden it's just a massive explosion yeah. and a whole row of houses would disappear and that was sure it. Them. And the same with the landmines, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, the landmines yeah. were were disaster. in the normal raid. They used to come down by parachute. You yeah. Know. yeah. Landmines, you know. Ooh. Devastator, a whole street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah where the, uh, the other bombs took out a house or two houses, yeah. Yeah. they took out a house. Yeah, the big one, like, yeah. yeah. Do you remember how, um, for the V1s, a good Spitfire pilot? That's right. Fly yeah. alongside. Yeah. And, and you wings. didn't actually pressure. touch, it was just yeah. air pressure. Uh, he would nudge his wing up like that. Yeah. And then the V1 would just roll Turn over. around. Go yeah. a different course. Yeah, yeah. And of course, with the V2s, we were very lucky because. We, had, we were controlling agents who were sending back false information about successes. So we were increasingly able to push those V2s away from London. And so they were landing, crashing in areas of lower population. Mm -hmm. But clearly, some were still getting through. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, a lot got through. A lot got through. I think, um, yeah, it's... <clears throat> but that was, that was later. I mean, that's a couple of years later. So that was... A, Almost a second blitz, if you like, but a technological one. Right? There, you know, there weren't men weren't involved. No, nobody flying these things. That is a very good point, there, James. My grandfather, he used to go up onto a railway bridge quite near to where we live, mm. and used to stand there with a steel helmet on. What he did that for, I have no idea. But he stood all the way, didn't care about the raid or the shrapnel or anything <coughs> like that. And then come the doodlebugs. He, could, he was terrified. He could not understand how these things could fly with no one in them. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the technology hadn't called up with my granddad. Do you, do you know, when, when you read of, uh, of uh, what if you watch Dad's Army, and you think of the rather cranky and bad-tempered air raid warning, oh, yeah. those guys were doing a really important job oh, they were and in quite a lot of danger at night. Yeah. Well, a lot of the air raid wardens, of course, were veterans from World War One. I. I mean, my father was an air raid warden. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they put their helmets on and their little ARP bomber jacket and went out and, and kept watch for things. Uh, <coughs> it's... Uh, well, where I lived, there was a St John's ambulance man next door to me, and next to his house was a fireman and his wife. His yeah. wife was a dispatcher on the... Um, where the fires were to send the mm. brigades to, you know. So uh, we had a 
fair share of it down our street, but luckily only the back of my house was blown out. Yeah. The window and bits of bits of the. Uh, there weren't the many houses. Weren't many houses that didn't lose their windows no, no, one no. way or another. They all got something, didn't they? Yeah. Right. Could you get glass replacements easily, or did well, they just have to suffer uh, with blocked up windows? Yeah. No, I don't know. That. Sort of cellophane and that sort of thing. Yeah, the, there was glass available, yeah. I think. And it, it was uh, very not in huge quantities. Tar paper was the tar yeah, paper, tar paper. Yeah, the thing for. The repairman came around very quickly. Yeah. It, is, it was very, it was very yeah. obvious to me that when the windows were blown in, within, well, the next day, yeah, somebody was around to fix it in some way or other. You and know? that was the Department of Public Works, was it? Yeah. Well, it was well, local right. town council, but obviously, um, you know. They must have been really busy, those guys. Oh, they were. They were. They never yeah. stopped. No. They were all. They were all guys that were either unfit for military service or too old for military service, and uh, and th th I mean th they were just as important as anybody else. I mean, at the end of the day, you could, uh, just by living in a house where all the windows have gone, it can get quite drafty, and the rain blows in and yeah. things like that. I mean, what what strikes me is that. Many of those people were doing a job during the day. That's right. Well, absolutely. That's right. And then doing a complete night shift. Absolutely. That's right. Five yeah. times a week. And yeah. and so we, in, you know, you know, sorry, Harry. In, in our street, we had a patrol all night. This was to uh, um, warn people about incendiary attacks and uh, put out that light if somebody showed a glimpse That's of, right. uh, yeah. you know. Um, but that that was every two hours the patrol changed. Yeah. And we used to have a log book where we put in any incidents. Um, yeah, so yeah. everybody, everybody chipped in. Yeah. Yeah. My maternal grandmother lived in the Blackfriars Road, right, just down from Waterloo Station, and I can remember going up there with my father, right, because as I say earlier, the tube still ran. <coughs> right, I'd go in to see if she. He wanted to go and see if she was all right, and literally going down, going down the Blackfriars Road, we'd climb all around by the old Vic and the cut. Climbing over rubble. I mean, London was in a bit of a mess in those days. Did did any of you, or have you still got a souvenir from that time? I had. Wow. I had. Uh, in one century, in century attack, uh, we happened to uh, get uh, the what was left of a bomb, an incendiary bomb, and my father took it to um, into work, and it was sil silvered uh, and left. And for years, that sat on the mantelpiece of our house. And then I joined the army, and um, all, all that, those disappeared. Disappeared. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Did the house burn down? <laughs> Sorry? Did the house burn down with the fire <laughs> on the mantelpiece? <laughs> yeah. uh, now, all of you, from memory, joined up, what, around 46, 47? Yeah. Right? Yeah. 1945. 45? Yeah. yeah. I was 46. But you joined I, after the war ended. I joined. Yes. I joined as a boy in 1940, September 1945. And what what was it like being in the army when the war was over? Three shillings a day. I remember was. Um, oh God, you were rich. Three shillings a day. Woodbines was Woodbines was sixpence for a packet of fire. Oh, yeah. Um, I enlisted at the end of 1945, uh, but that would have meant I would have had to go boy service, and which meant that my parents had to agree. And they wouldn't agree, so I was put on the reserve in Fort Dundee Fort, and then when I reached the, the age of seventeen and a half, I think it was, um, in March the following year, I was called up for my basic training. And that was the Inniskilling Fusiliers. Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers, yeah, yeah. And how long did you stay? In the army? How long uh, did you stay? I was there six years. Six years. Right. Yeah. And what was your experience? I, I went to what they called the Army Apprentice School at uh, Chepstow down in Monmouth. Engineer? Yeah. Right. So I did a, a, a three-year general engineering apprenticeship, and I, I came into the Royal Engineers in 1948, um, when a lot of the guys that had been in, did, discharged from the war, because there was very little work, were coming back in. And so my, my, the trade that I spent three years learning was basically redundant. So I had to change, had an opportunity to remaster, and I chose to become a refrigeration mechanic. Right? In 1948, refrigeration was pretty primitive, and uh, and uh, 
that was a decision that I now look back on and think it changed the whole of my military life because I never always went on individual posts. I went where refrigeration was needed. And that's why you saw the nuclear blast, presumably? Well, part of it, yeah. Because, I mean, don't get me... Uh, I mean, Christmas Island wasn't... It was a military establishment, but it was not military in the way that people don't think about it. There was no parades, there was no polished boots, there was no nothing. Everybody was doing a specific job. Engineers were engineering, cooks were cooking, you know. And it was hot. Yeah, MT guys were repairing vehicles, and nobody polished their boots. <laughs> what was your experience, Harry, when uh, you joined up? Well, I joined up as a van boy in 1946, 1st of August, and uh, I was posted to Wrexham in North Wales. I think it was the first time I'd ever been about, uh, anywhere above the Thames, you know, to the north of the Thames, and uh, got to Wrexham, and uh, after a couple of days... The bandmaster said to me, what instrument do you want to play, Puttick? So I said, oh, I'd like to want to play a trumpet, sir, because my father used to play a trumpet. He said, I've got enough trumpets here. I was a clarinet and a tutor. Go and learn it. And that was it, my introduction to the Royal Welsh Fusiliers Band in 1946. Fantastic. But it, things looked up after that. It was a great regiment and a great bunch of lads I was with. So, uh, How long were you in? I was in for <coughs> 30 years. Yeah. Uh, that's a lie, it's a few <coughs> days short, but adding on the days hurts my brain. So I think we'll just leave it there. <laughs> now, we, we started this session late because we had a few technical issues. Uh, but we've got questions coming in from the real world out there. Oh, yeah. And Nicola Ayton, or Arton, she says, has your experience of the Blitz affected you into adult life? Certainly hadn't. I, I, I cannot no. uh, record. No, it hasn't. It hasn't. It hasn't. No, it has, it has, in what respect? Basically, it was a case of getting on with it. I mean, I don't jump when things go bang, if that's what... No. Yeah. No, I don't. Not really. Well, as I said before, I mean, I think the Germans were surprised. It wasn't just that Londoners were plucky. They somehow shrugged off the mental effects of that yeah. constant aerial bombing at night. Yeah, and then they switched out into the uh, places like Birmingham and Southampton, Plymouth, mm, yeah. Liverpool, That's Manchester. Right. So, really, a lot of the stuff had been absorbed in, in London, but we didn't, weren't any worse off than what the other people, and they don't look as if they've had any uh, ill effects after it, or even decent effects. They just got on with their lives. Which Someone else is asking whether... Um, uh, your experience in the Blitz made you want to join the army? I mean, did you want to, you know, fight back, do your bit? Is that why you joined the army? Well, age, age had to come into it, of yeah. course. Uh, but it was always my ambition to join the army, even when I was a young 11-year-old, 12-year-old. Um, I'd always considered the army, uh, or being a soldier, as being a vocation, just as much as any other profession. Rightly or wrongly, that's my, that was my, um, yeah. Well, out of, th out of three sons and a daughter that my parents had, I was the only one, I was the youngest, and I was the only one that was not in uniform. I had one brother in the army, one brother in the RF, and my sister was in the navy. And I, quite frankly, I couldn't wait to get, in, get, get into the army. I wanted to join the army anyway. Yeah. My father was a, a military man. He was cavalry in World War I. And uh, at the end of the day, right, I couldn't wait to get in. And like Harry, I mean, I did 25 years, and I don't regret a, a, a single day of it. It gave me very good qualifications, got a very good job when I left the army, and I have no regrets at all. Yeah, and I commend it to some of the young men today. You know, that's what I was going to ask you, James, yeah. whether you think that more people should join up. Well, it, it, the army is a very technical place to be, regardless. Yeah. Just remember that you know, the statistics still apply. For every one guy in the front line carrying a rifle, it takes ten behind him right, to make sure he's properly equipped, maintained and everything else. So there are massive opportunities for very, very good education in the Army. As an engineer, you would know that. We That's now right. have the most yeah. amazing complex kit. Yeah. Aircraft that can do the job of 50 aircraft. Right. That's excellent. Yeah. 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 Now, I'm going to ask you a bit of an awkward question because the governor may be watching this. 
What's the best thing about being a Chelsea pensioner? I think it's about. I think it's not having anything to worry about. I mean, it, think of this place. I mean, it's it's an incredible building. It's an incredible history. Um, you are among kindred spirits. I mean, we all sit here. There's 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 no case of not. We've all been there, done it, got the T-shirt. Let's put it that way. And at the end of the day, you recognise that. Um, we looked after remarkably well. I sleep like a log every night because I don't have to worry about maintaining a house, mowing the grass, or anything like that. Oh, that's right. You know, and it's uh, well, you Harry. It takes your worries away. Similar, likewise. Yeah. I mean, personally, I think it's a no-brainer for people who want, who are left on their own. Absolutely. And they're, they're, they feel on their own. It's the camaraderie. And you need, yes, the camaraderie and the banter that we say amongst ourselves, you know? Oh, yeah, don't and come up here with a thin we skin. We all do plenty of that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's a, a good place to come and be looked after because we are looked after, particularly through this nasty oh, period it. we're going through now. Indeed. I don't want to sort of get brownie points, but I think the governor's got it on the nail. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. And we did lose 10 people to, to COVID, yeah. but that was at the very beginning of the... Uh, exactly. And it, one would harshly say to be expected. Yeah. But uh, touching wood, we've been clear ever since. And you know that those numbers are fantastic when you compare them to the outside world. Oh, yeah, I, I, yes. I, I, I mean, I know one of the philosophies here yeah. is about well-being. I mean, you mentioned you're well-fed, but you know, fitness is important here. Both mental and physical fitness. But there's also a certain amount of discipline here, which we all have been used to in our serving years. And, of course, um, it applies to washing your hands and all this, all the, um, the things that we have to do to prevent the uh, spread of the uh, COVID. Self-discipline is the important factor. Agreed. That we, you know, say, that's it, do it. Not everybody likes to do it, but... I can't say there's things, there's some things I don't like, but then again, you know, that happens to everybody, doesn't it? Any, you know, any I, life. I was inspired by watching colleagues living in, working seven days a week, 12 to 14 hour days, yeah. everyone mucking in and helping, and yeah. one huge family. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, do you think this, this is the legacy of your military career? Because in the military, you learn to support each other. You look after your brother in arms. Or your That's an essential, an essential element of being in the army. Yeah, if you, you, you don't have to necessarily like the man standing next it, to you. But you support him. And yeah. I think we all joined the army as young, very young men. I, I joined as a boy. You know, Eddie joined as a boy. So. <clears throat> when you come to the end of your life, um, and I'm not... I'm not being morbid here, but when you come to your later years, that's really that way. Uh, you're living alone because, at the end of the day, one of the prerequisites you you know, your family's grown up, you know, your wife is unfortunately gone or, or uh, for whatever reason. Um, what better place to be? You know, you, you, you start young and join the army, you live in the army. Um, you may have gone out into civil life and had another. I mean, I did 25 years in industry, right? And I left the army in 1970. But I was sitting in my house down in Hampshire one day and I looked out the window and thought, here I am, you know, in my middle 80s. I don't really want to mow the grass anymore. I don't want to lay in bed when the wind's blowing like stinking, worrying if I'm going to go in the following day to get the tiles fixed. Why don't I go back and, you know, apply to go to Chelsea and go back to where I began? That's right. you know, one of the things that inspires me is knowing that every one of you still gives something back. Oh, yeah. You all fundraise, you all support local charities, people speak to, to school children to educate them about the war and the Blitz in particular, I think, because you can, you can somehow meet minds if you're of a similar age to them as you were during, during the Blitz. That's right. And that's really important. I think, I think it's an important point because I think we would all agree that the one thing during this COVID crisis that we miss is the interaction with the public. We miss the people that come up and say, can we look around the hospital? Yeah. We miss meeting people when we walk around Ranley Gardens. Absolutely. The little old ladies that come in and sit there every 
You can yeah. sit and have a chat with them, you know. Be good. It'd be good when we can get out and start talking to people again. Well, I mean, I cross my fingers it's soon, but I think we, you know, we have a little bit further to go. Um, one of the great things about the Royal Hospital is tradition, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And it goes back over 300 years. Exactly. And, you know, it's amazing when you can show people what the births used to be like and what they are now. Oh, yeah. But this isn't a place that stands still. It's a place that wants to reach out to the outside world. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm just the question I've been asked here is on my iPad. You know, how important is it that we capture conversations like the one we've had this afternoon for posterity, for the future? Mm -hmm. You know, we all will come and go, and yet this is a really important part of our national history, that period through 1940, 1941, when things could have gone very badly wrong. True. And, the, and the numbers, oh, of, yeah. for example, aircraft during the Battle of Britain and then through the Blitz, they were pretty finely balanced on both sides. So it could have gone either way. So do you think we should capture more of these conversations? Yeah, I, I, yeah why I not? We, I think we do, uh, in another sense, within the, within the hospital ourselves, we, um, we, we go out to other, um, other events and um, converse with people who we meet. Not, it hasn't been such as we've had to hear this afternoon, but um, I, I take your point, Noel. It, it's, uh, it's vital, I think, that um, such experiences uh, should be put on record and... Uh, a chap called, a military historian called Saul David wrote a very good book called Victoria's Small Wars. And it was, uh, it was about Queen Victoria and her reign and the small wars she had. Not the big ones, the small ones. Well, somebody ought to write a book about Queen Elizabeth's small wars. Because at the moment, a lot of it is overshadowed by Afghanistan and Iraq and so on and so forth. But most of us here that live here have been involved in campaigns that got very little publicity. A lot of people didn't even know about them. Uh, and yet, right, everybody here, in one form or another, has at some time or another been in harm's way. Do you know what uh, always sticks in my mind is that there's only been, I think, one year since 1945 correct. that we have not been at war. That's right, right. correct. Been a, a small or a big campaign, but we've been engaged all the time. And that's something we should be proud of. Yeah, it? right. yes. it's, it's so true. Both world wars, 1418, 39, were both de designated as the war to end all wars. And yet, wars have been... Um, oh, here I'm bringing politics into it. No, don't do that. <laughs> no. Um, I've got uh, my, my head hurts when you do that. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, We've been at war, and uh, you're right, Noel. Only one year has been, has there been no conflict anywhere in Europe, across the world, you know. I'm going to cut it there. I, I hope that uh, you've got a flavour from this uh, delightful conversation with these three wonderful colleagues here about their experiences during the Blitz. And it was a long time ago, but I think we've had huge clarity about what that experience was like and... Uh, just living through real adversity. So I, I'd like to thank uh, Harry, James and Eddie for some superb contributions. You've absolutely been fantastic. I've learned a lot. And more importantly, I've really enjoyed this three-way conversation. And thank you for watching this session of the Chelsea History Festival.